Welcome to the Debrief Podcast with Matt Brown, the podcast where pastor and author Matt Brown debriefs your questions about Christianity and current issues shaping our culture. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to the Debrief. And I am super excited to have my buddy Nate Westwick here joining us for the first time. First time. Yes. Long time listener, first time guest. <laughs> first time caller. Yes. Okay. So we're going to do uh, like what, when we uh, talk about our wives, how we met. Yes. So we're not married for the record. Never no. even. I mean, we are married, date. but not to yes, each other. Yes, we're not married yeah. to each other. Never even been on a date True. with each other. Uh, how did we meet? I'm curious what your story is. Yeah. What is my story? So we first started attending Sandals in the VCC days. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So that's been like 1999, 2000. Let's call it 2000. Okay. Because I had married my wife in 1999. I think we started attending sandals in 2000. So that would have been a while ago. When we actually met? It's a good question. I don't know. Sometime after 2000. I have a memory of us sitting (coughs) sitting on a sidewalk talking. I don't know if that's real or I dreamt it or it's a vision from the Lord. But... um, (laughs) Yeah, and then could be I, in the future. After this, we can yeah, sit on the side. And then I remember chat. talking about church hurt. You, yes. you were a part of another church, yep. and and that went south. Yep. And um, man, I just re- remember praying for you. Like, man, I'm so sorry. Yeah. And, you know, church hurt's a real thing. And, that was a pivotal. That conversation was pivotal. I've told yeah, you about that. Yeah. But that was, you know, through you, the Holy Spirit saved me from a really dark path. Yeah. 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 So, oh man. And anybody out there who's been hurt by church, just know that the church is full of people. And, uh, you know, we serve a perfect Lord, but we serve him with broken people. Mm -hmm. And it's really easy to lose your faith in the church very, very easily if your attention is not on Jesus and it's on his people. Amen. It's why there's so many passages to love his people because they're they're not uh, super easy. So tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, family background business. Yeah, so... Um, I turned 50 this year, okay. which is super exciting. So okay. it's a big year for our family. My wife turns 45. Wow. We celebrate our 25th anniversary and then I turn 50. So lots of multiples of five, which my wife and I are both math majors. And so we like multiples of five. It's a very, uh, you know, attractive thing. I so, hated people like you in college. It's okay. You know, I've been hated a lot. So. Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I get thick skinned. So yeah, I got three boys. Uh, my oldest is a freshman at CBU studying civil engineering, mm. having the time of his life. He's in uh, Southern Utah skiing right now, which is awesome. Mm. And my middle is a 17-year-old junior at Rev Redlands East Valley High School. Right on. And uh, youngest is a freshman, just made the golf team. So that's I exciting. It. I love it. So we get to do father-son bonding on the golf course. It's yes. for the relationship. Yeah, of yeah, course. yeah, yeah. Now you have an awesome business. Tell us about that. Yeah. So I started Wild Goose Coffee Roasters back in 2008. I used to be a high school math teacher at my alma mater, Ukaipa High School. Okay. And um, started the business, did five years of overlap, growing the business while staying in the classroom. That was one year too many. And, um, you know, growing a business is not for the faint of heart, but uh, it's been super cool. So business has been around for just over 15 years now, if I did the math right. And uh, yeah, man, we roast really great coffee. We donate 10 pounds of food to local food banks for every pound of coffee that's sold. And that's become my full-time gig. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. One of my favorite Christmas presents was for Pastor Andrew Bogenwright and he bought me yeah. one bag of coffee. Do you call it a bag? What do you call it? Yeah. It was one, a coffee subscription. That yes. You coffee su- a subscription every month. He didn't give me that gift again. <laughs> I just all pray for Pastor Andrew. That's right. Yeah. That was my, I, I just remember <laughs> looking forward to it every month. So yeah. um, I love your guys' coffee. I Thank love you. it. I think it's great coffee. And I love you for two reasons. I love your entrepreneurial spirit Mm. and I love your drive. Mm. And there's very, very few people that I meet that I feel like can match that intensity with me and you've Mm. matched that. And I appreciate that about Mm. you. So how long would you say you've been at Sandals? Because you were at Sandals in the beginning. You took a hiatus to help another church plant, I think. Yep. And then you came back. So So I'm horrible with chronology, but I want to say around seven years Mm -hmm. in the first go around. And then God called us to start, help start a church. I was not the head pastor, but I helped it get off the ground. That was another seven-ish years and then a little season of wandering, trying to figure out, you know, faith in God and things like that. Mm. And I believe I've been back to Sandals for 10 years. Okay. I think. Yeah. Something like that. Well, I'm glad you're back. Me too. So let's talk about your book. Um, I'm going to put this up here, uh, Clearing the Path. And so this is not my book, everybody. I I think it's important that as Christians, we support, you don't have to hold up my book. (laughs) I think think it's important that we support Christian writing, Christian films. I just was on uh, the phone with a Christian director. And he literally is like, Matt, I need to raise $2 million today Hmm. to get this film off the ground. And if you're a Christian out there, it's so important that you support God's causes. So many Christians want to change America through the law. 
do change America through your generosity. Support Christian yeah. books, support Christian uh, speakers, your church, a podcast, a movie. You know, Christians mock. This is one of the things that drives me crazy. They mock um, things that other Christians do. I was telling mm. you guys before the show, I just got my first bad review on my book. And it was, a, I don't know if it's a zero or a one. So me, look, it's a one. And it said, not worth the price. So yeah. it's just like, and, and for whoever, you know, you're entitled to your opinion. Thank you for your honesty. But it's just like, oh my gosh, somebody puts six months, nine months worth of effort, pours their heart and soul out. And there's somebody like, and we just attack Christians. Yeah. You know, um, we have no, no problem spending, you know, six bucks for a cup of coffee at Starbucks, but you're a Christian trying to do good things. And by the way, Wild Goose is named after the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's one of the, story. yeah, one of the names, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit, because you don't know what he's going to do. But as Christians, we just kind of mock, put down, make fun of Christians that are trying to do things. And so I just want to mm -hmm. encourage you to get this book. I actually wrote the forward uh, for this book because I love it. And one of the things I said, Nate, in the forward is when I gave my life to Christ, I was ready to die for him, but I did not realize how hard it would be to live for him. Yeah. And so that was a huge, <clears throat> huge issue for me. And so much of the Christian life is how do I get through the mundane? Mm -hmm. Like for those of you, people that get married, it's easy to fall in love and get married. It's hard to do the day to day. Right. And so how do I follow Jesus day to day? But your book, Clearing the Path, uh, Connecting with God in a Cluttered World is so fantastic. And you are such a gifted writer. Thank you. Um, I love it. I love this book. Get this. But tell us about Clearing the Path. Um, why did you write it? And then who is it for? Yeah. So I think there's um, there's an interesting discrepancy when you look at people who interacted with Jesus in the flesh mm -hmm. and how their lives were drastically transformed compared with the average Christian for today. Mm -hmm. The average Christian has a set of beliefs that they might have, um, you know, maybe some things they do, some routines, some do's, some don'ts. Very rarely do you see lives legitimately transformed. And so um, clearing the path is an effort to kind of demystify the spiritual life a little bit. Because I think a lot of people think that uh, to be a serious Christian, you have to be a pastor or right. a minister or a priest or something. And that that's just for a very small percentage, say 5%, 10% of the population of Christians, if that. So what do you do with the other 95%, right? Is it just a set of beliefs? Is it, uh, you know, or can we make it more than that? And so clearing the path is a way to usher in the personal experience of Jesus into our lives. And so, you know, we talk a lot about holiness. A lot of people agree like holiness sounds great, but how do we get there? Yeah. Right. And if we live a holy life, we can enjoy communion with Jesus that does transform us. And if we're transformed, you were talking about Christians, you know, supporting other businesses and things like that, right? Like mm -hmm. Christian causes. I think one of the biggest things we can do as Christians is to be transformed ourselves because out of that space, we can then transform our relationships, yeah. our workplaces, our, our communities, and you know, and our world. And so um, clearing the path is an effort to demystify that process, help people pursue holiness in a way that's practical, easy to follow, mm -hmm. like we're having a conversation instead of super intellectual and, and heady and difficult to understand. Yeah. So. yeah, and so for those of you guys who attend... Um, Sandals Church, and you're a part of a community group. Nate helps me each week write the community group, group questions, and you've been doing that for a couple of years. Couple of years, yeah. and so you're actually being blessed by his writing each and every week, his thought process. So he sits with me in the studio. I mean, I send you guys kind of, you know, five or six questions that are my thoughts, and you guys make them better. And mm -hmm. so I'm very, very thankful for that because oftentimes when I get to the end of my message, you know, creatively, I'm just kind of done. Sure. And so I don't have all the time, the, the, the amount of time that I would like to spend on the questions, you know, because I think questions are important. And, um, you know, Jesus answers three questions and asks 300 in the gospels. Mm -hmm. I think that tells us something. Questions mm -hmm. are important. And so, like you said, Christianity is a set of beliefs. So it's, it's like, here's, here's my statements of faith right. rather than what are, what are the, what are healthy questions of faith? And yeah. so, um, I think what you help us do as a church is you help us probe and ask deep questions to move us along. I love the questions last week. I love the new format that you guys are mm -hmm. doing. Let's get started. Keep going, going deeper. I think that's fantastic because we're all we're all in different places. Right. You know, for some people, this this is their first community group. They've never been. Other people, they're a longtime Christian. Um, but you just help shape our church spiritually. And so if you want to be more shaped by uh, Nathan, get his book. 
And one of my good friends said, and I'm a little hurt by this, but it's the best book they've ever read. So huh. I know. And I'm not going to tell you who it is because- <laughs> I kind of want to know now. I've unfriended them. <laughs> <laughs> As you should. As you yeah. should. I do want to say too, I think yeah. a lot of people focus their spiritual journey on knowing things. Mm -hmm. And even the small group questions are are not aimed at knowledge as much as they are um, relationships. Because I think it's through relationships that we're transformed. Mm -hmm. And so it's that relationship with Jesus, with others. Mm -hmm. Knowledge can be imparted, but knowledge will only take us so far. Mm -hmm. Like I studied a lot of you know math, physics, engineering in, in yeah. college, but that didn't transform me as a human being. Right. It's the relationships with other believers that has transformed me to be a better husband, father, worker, et cetera. And so yeah, I think we, you know, the aim of the small group questions, the aim of your book, my book is personal engagement with Jesus because that's where true transformation happens. Yeah. Amen. And let me say this again, why small group is so important. I know so many people are freaked out. COVID has changed us culturally. I would say we were already an isolated culture. Mm -hmm. We're even more isolated now. Um, in the UK, they have now branded loneliness as a, uh, it, it's a, it's a crisis of culture. Because church was one of the ways that you connected. And as people pull away from church, now we're not having families. We're separated mm -hmm. from our kids. We're not as close as we used to. And anything on a screen is not a relationship. Like, I'm glad you guys are watching. I'm glad you're listening. A podcast is not a pastor. A pastor is a pastor. And, you know, people all the time ask me questions. And we've got some great questions. And I say, what campus do you go to? Mm -hmm. Process this with your pastor. Mm -hmm. Somebody that knows you is processing this with you. Maybe it's a minister, somebody who works in soul care at Sandals Church, somebody that can really sit with you and go on, go with you on this journey. Because a lot of people think it's like, what's just the right answer? And it's like, hold on. Right. Let's ask some better questions. And that is the process of soul care counseling. You know, I had my therapist on the show a couple mm -hmm. of weeks ago. Yep. And let me tell you, that was weird. You know, sitting imagine. down with somebody, you know, where right. you're like, Who wow, you know you. everything. Yeah. So um, it was a great, great process. Well, even you talk about questions, you look at the questions Jesus asked, you know, it's, it's a different question for different people for different yes. situations. And it's because he knows them. Mm -hmm. And so I think our soul's deepest longing is to be seen, known, and yes. loved. And Jesus is the only one who actually can do that. Mm -hmm. And he uses us to ask people questions like that, right? Mm -hmm. But every situation calls for something different. And I think that's the beauty of a relationship with Jesus is that he knows you well, he knows me well, and can ask those penetrating questions that actually lead me into more of myself. Mm -hmm. And that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Um, I was listening to a podcast today by N.T. Wright, and mm -hmm. um, he was talking about how the American church has only had one half of the justification conversation. Huh. And so for those of you who don't know what justification is, is this idea that because of what Jesus did for me on the cross, I'm justified. And so I grew up in Calvary Chapel in my faith early on, and Greg Laurie would say this, it's just as if I never sinned. Hmm. So that's the way that it's explained in the Western church. And he just said, justification comes to us first in Galatians. And it's not a judicial problem. It's a relational problem. Hmm. Do I have to be Jewish to be Jesus? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, what he what what he talked about was justification is this idea that because you're in Christ and I'm in Christ, we can share a meal together, we can eat together, we can pray together, and I don't have to be Jewish to worship God with you. And it's this idea that Christianity is around the table yeah. from the very very beginning. It was a with others religion, and the blood on the cross not only makes me right with God, but it makes me right with others. Yep. And so the church is to be the model of multicultural, multi-ethnic, multiple languages. We are to do it better than everyone else because we have Jesus that brings us together. And so get in a small group today. I can't, I can't encourage you. You know, there's just so many people. I was talking to a guy and, you know, he, he says he listens to a debrief. I don't know if he does or not. So if, you know, you hear this, be convicted, but I don't want you to feel bad. But we're just having a conversation and he literally just rattled off. Oh yeah, I was born again two years ago. Jesus changed my life. And I'm like, oh, he goes, I go to your church. And I said, oh, what campus do you go to? And he's like, oh, I haven't been in two years. Mm. And that's not even a problem for him in his religion. Mm -hmm. That he can be that disconnected. And on TikTok everywhere, I'm watching these guys that are like, you don't need to go to church. You, you know, tell me the place where it says you have to go to church on Sunday. And, and what I would say is, okay, there's a limited verses where I could point to that, but it's because they were doing life together Monday through Sunday. Right. They were a, they were a family. Well, and I and, would even say like, yeah. if you haven't been to church, yeah. set foot in a church yeah. and see how you feel afterwards. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Amen. it's almost impossible to walk into a church without feeling uplifted. And that's not coincidental. Yeah. It's because the Holy Spirit is there and Amen. we need to engage with the Holy Spirit on a regular basis. Yeah. And I'm glad others. you said that, you know, I got to sit in church with my wife and kids 
when John Bevere preached mm. and I was just weeping through worship. Yeah. And part of that was because I didn't, I wasn't worried about preaching. Like, I'm like, yeah. you know, uh, you know, do I have to pee? Am I going to burp? You know, <laughs> like, you know, am I ready? Um, is the crowd full? Is it not full? I mean, these are all the things fleshly that I worry about because I'm a human being and I was just able to sit in worship and I just wept. It yeah. was just, it was beautiful for me to be in church. And so- Well, and the church family is so powerful. Yeah. Even just this past, you know, recently, I was going to give a specific time yeah. frame, but recently I was with some family and, and uh, it was a really great time, but there was also something missing. Mm -hmm. And as I was processing that with my wife, I was like, man, I just, I can't wait to go to church and just be around my church family mm -hmm. because it's a, you know, Church is a place where we can love and receive love, mm -hmm. um, where we can be in community. And there's something special when the Holy Spirit engages with other people. And uh, yeah, man, it was like water to my soul. It was great. Yeah. And, you know, there's just a lot of judgment out there socially against the church. And again, people take one wound, one experience, yeah. and they make that true for 3.4 billion Christians on well, earth. And the truth is we do get wounded by the church. Yes. Oh, yeah. So, but how do we recover? Yeah. Right. Are we going to let that take us out? Or are we going to find people who can usher us through those stages yeah. and say, you know, no, Jesus hasn't abandoned you. You may feel abandoned, but he didn't abandon you. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you got wounded and it was real. <clears throat> it was real. But God used the pastor mm -hmm. of a church that you didn't go to. Mm -hmm. And we sat down, we talked to begin redirecting you on your path. And so, um, not to push my book, but in my book, I, I actually was on uh, TV this week. I want to push your book because your book is excellent. Oh, thank you. It really is. Thank you. Yeah. I was on a TV show, uh, Monday morning, Time Change. Let me just tell you, I don't know who booked that, but so it was an East Coast, um, an East Coast show. So literally our crew is setting up the cameras. It's dark outside <laughs> on Monday morning, 6 a.m., which is really 5 a.m. Right. And I know we got construction people in our church. I love you. God bless you. I cannot do that. <laughs> I'm more man than I am. You know, yeah. they went to the tomb early in the morning and he was not there. So that's why I, I worship <laughs> God later. But, um, you know, the, the host was reading the chapter on emotional healing. Mm. And what I said in that chapter was, look, people, Satan uses people's hands and words to wound you, but the Lord borrows other hands yeah. and other words Amen. to heal you. So good. And so um, what I love in that story is, um, I, did you did you finish the book yet? You're much faster. Yet. Okay. Yeah. So I used the story of the woman who bled for 12 years and Jesus does this incredible thing. So she touches her robe. She's healed miracle, right? That's what we all want. Yeah. And he publicly embarrasses her and calls her out by name. And so why does he do that? It's not to embarrass her, it's to set her free. Yep. Because what she needs to do is tell her story. Mm -hmm. And so, right, so people have shamed her, mocked her, isolated her, uh, probably had no family. If she had a husband, he had long left her. And so Jesus says, you know, tell your story, what happened? And he calls her out. And so part of our emotional path and healing is being called out and saying, and I'm so grateful that you reached out to me. We were able to talk and that helped get you on the right path because yeah. you were a true believer that got wounded. Yeah. And well, and I think with the lady with the bleeding too, yeah. you know, I've got to believe that she touched the fringe of his garment because she didn't feel worthy. Yes. And for Jesus to turn and, and just look her in the eyes yeah. is like, hey, I see you. Yeah. You actually matter. You have dignity. You have worth. Yes. And that's so important. Yeah. So important. And that's God. Yeah. So if you're not attending a church and you're listening to this podcast, first of all, thank you. Uh, but get to church. Get to church. Even if it's not Sandals Church, get to a church, a, a great church. There are tons of great churches and um, get in a church, get in a great Bible-believing community. And um, I love you guys. All right, let's jump into the first question. Samaya, uh, actually, I think it's Samaya uh, from Riverside, California. I, I know this gal. Does God still discipline or punish us? This is a great question. You want right. me to go first or you? I can take a stab. Okay, I, yeah. You know, I'm a parent of three teenage boys. Okay. Um, I hate to discipline my kids. Mm. But if I'm angry, and I'll tie this into God in a second, if I'm angry, I'm a, I'm a bad disciplinarian. Okay. But if I allow natural consequences to pay, to play out, yeah. that's actually more loving than swooping in and trying to rescue. Mm. And so, you know, God puts those parenting instincts in us because he is the ultimate parent. And so I would say, you know, does God punish us? To me, that's a question about the heart of God. Mm -hmm. You know, is God for you or is he against you? Because if we believe God is against us, we have a false view of God. Mm -hmm. But if we believe God is for us, it doesn't mean he's going to protect us from any discomfort, but it does mean that in his for us state, he's going to allow us to experience natural consequences of decisions right. we've made, good or bad, so that we can ultimately draw closer to him. Yeah, so. man, that's a fantastic answer. Uh, Samaya, so I, I would um, parse the word discipline from punish. So I would separate those yeah. words. 
So does God discipline us? Yes, every day. So the book of Hebrews says God disciplines those he loves. Mm -hmm. And the number one issue and every uh, social study on this is revealing, we're not raising good kids in America because we don't know how to discipline. Yes. Our school systems, educa sure. education is a disaster because we're not disciplining kids. We're making excuses for behavior and we're not allowing them to experience consequence. Yeah. And so, and so, you know, and so it affects kids long-term because they don't know how to deal with consequence, disappointment. They don't develop grit. Resilience, and so because God yeah. loves us, right, he allows us to do that. So then the word punish, is God punitive? Occasionally. For example, uh, this is really hard for a lot of Christians. David sins. He has an affair with Bathsheba, and then he tries to cover up the sin. This is an egregious sin. He murders Bathsheba's husband, who, by the way, is loyal to him. Yeah. And, and he kills him. And so the Lord takes the life of his child. And so when people read that, so here, here's the question, I think, uh, Samaya, uh, Samaya, sorry, is, is the Lord going to punish me like he did David? So my question would be, Samaya, are you the king of Israel? Hmm. So here's what is throughout scripture, the greater the leadership, the greater the responsibility. Hmm. David was handpicked by God. He was a shepherd, you know, and God gave him the lottery numbers, right? Here you go, here's the numbers. And so there was some an accountability there. And so God, yes, God did punish David for his sins. He actually let David, in, in some occasions, choose his punishment. Mm -hmm. But David had to be held accountable for the fact that he was the king of Israel. Also, the people of God in the Old Testament are chosen and they enter into a free will agreement with God where God says, if you don't remain faithful, I'm gonna hand you over to the natural consequences and allow other nations that I've protected you from really to feast upon you. And so I would say, uh, Samaya, Samaya, sorry, I get her name wrong every time, Samaya, yes, there are natural consequences to life and, and we all experience that. So now let's, move forward. I, I wanna, know our I want to talk to yeah. you about significance because yeah. yeah. I think a lot of people, especially young people, want a life of significance. Yes. And we have to be careful what we ask for, yes. right? Because to the higher level that we rise, yeah. more is going to be asked of us. Mm -hmm. um, God's going to hold us to a higher standard. Yeah. You know, you know that firsthand as a pastor. And so, um, you know, not that we should strive for insignificance so that we can get by <clears throat> scot-free, but I think you're absolutely right. God does punish certain people yeah. for you know their responsibilities. It's one of the things when I interact with the wealthy in our church, mm. I worry for them mm. because they've been given so much. Yeah. And not if you're a wealthy person listening, I'm not saying this is you, but most of the wealthy people I interact with are not generous. Mm. The most generous people in our church are people like me and you, everyday people that love God, love our life, and you know we pay our bills and we, we do the best that we can. Mm. And so, you know, James says in the book of James, those who are in leadership will get a stricter judgment. Mm -hmm. And so I will be held more accountable than the average person. And so, um, and I think that's important for all of us because we've all been disappointed by leaders yeah. um, who are, you know, making millions of dollars, fleecing the church. You know, wh whenever, um, you know, the church sets my salary, the board goes into a room, I'm not present but I'm always thinking about, you know, the single mom in our church yeah. that's trusting God and writing checks. And um, I'm more blessed than that financially. But I always in the back of my mind, remember that, that, mm -hmm. you know, part of the way I make my living is off the generosity and faithfulness of the people of God. And I never, ever want to forget that. Yeah. Um, and I know, you know, I feel like with government oftentimes, and this isn't, a, you know, I'm not going after anybody that works in government, but I don't feel as an American citizen that my hard earned dollars are carefully spent. Mm -hmm. I feel like oftentimes they're wasted and those are hard dollars for me to come up with. And so I want as a church for us to be very, very careful with how we spend God's money. And it's really easy to just be like, well, it's a big church, so there's lots of money so we can do what we want. Okay, so I know our sins are forgiven when we repent, but does he still let things happen to maybe teach us a bigger lesson? I would say absolutely. And that's just the natural consequence. So the Bible doesn't teach karma, but it does teach sowing. Mm -hmm. So what you sow, and, and I know everybody's like, okay, so <laughs> knitting, no, farming. It's for Indiana listeners. Yeah, for, Indi yeah. for our Indiana listeners. <clears throat> what you plant in the ground, that's what's coming up. Mm -hmm. And so the more sin you plant, the more sin is going to sprout. Now it may not come today, it may not come tomorrow, but eventually if I plant corn in the ground, corn is going to come up. And so we got to be careful, you know, that, you know, we don't, we're not Buddhists and we don't believe in karma because we believe in grace. And so grace intervenes karma. 
So karma, a Buddhist doesn't have grace. Like you just, mm-hmm. you're just caught in this cycle of life you until deserve. you get it right. You're, mm-hmm. you're trapped on a Ferris wheel basically until you eventually hit nirvana where it's just like, okay, you've gotten good enough to where you get to cease to exist. That's their heaven. Yeah. And, and I know Buddhists try to shape it around our personal heaven, but it's just not. It's just literally like you get to be done now. Um, but for us Christians, man, when I sow sin, God can forgive me of my issues with him, but I have to face the consequences of life. Like, for example, I, I was talking with a young man in our church who accidentally his statement, not mine, killed somebody. Mm. And, I, you know, we were talking in the room and he just wanted to know what would God forgive him? And I said, of course, but that doesn't mean you don't have to deal with the law because right. you've taken someone's life. Yeah. And his parents didn't appreciate that. <laughs> they didn't like that, but that's the truth. It is the truth. When we, and so many young people today, you know, don't understand you know, consequences, we watch movies and TVs and, and, and so like everybody lives and there isn't really, you know, consequences playing video games, but when somebody dies because you're fooling around, there's a consequence. And ultimately what I told him is, you know, you're probably going to be incarcerated. Mm. And, and his parents didn't like that because what they wanted was God to, you know, make it all go away. And I don't know that that would have been beneficial. Yeah. Um, I think he needed to you know, face the consequence for his sin, which ultimately led to the, the loss of someone's life. And um, and so- Well, and you talk about reaping what you sow. And I mm-hmm. think, you know, it can be really easy in Christianity to what Dallas Willard calls the gospel of sin management. Yeah. So you're, you're talking about yeah. planting corn. Yeah. You know, say you're planting corn and you're hoping peaches grow. Yeah. You know, we're going to trim off all the corn and you're dealing yeah. with everything external. But what we really have to do is to get into the heart level. Mm-hmm. What is it that I'm focusing my attentions on? What is it that I'm, you know, mm-hmm. what so what seeds am I sowing in my heart? Right. Because out of that place, everything else is going to flow. And mm-hmm. so, you know, I think we get it wrong as Christians when we try to manage our behavior. And, um, with, and that's where that pursuit of holiness comes in, right? Like, how do we transform ourselves from the inside out so that we have more good fruit? being sown rather than, you right. know, yeah, and nobody's perfect and we're yeah. all going to have stuff we need to trim off and things like that. But um, I think that's where that transformation piece comes. And so, you know, mm-hmm. to your sowing corn, yeah, you know. Yeah. And so, Samaya, you know, there are consequences that you're going to have to live out for the choices that you've made. And we all experience this, mm-hmm. but, you know, the beauty of Romans eight twenty eight is that God can use all things for good to, yeah. for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And so, and I think people miss that yeah. because they think, okay, I did the thing. It's going to be good instantly. Mm-hmm. And that's not the human no, experience. That's yeah. just not true. Yeah, and I think it does ultimately end up in good yeah. if we allow him to. And I grow, I hate this, but I grow far more through suffering and failure yes. than I do through success. I so, want to say amen, but I don't want to say amen. Know. It's so true. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Amy, Crestline, um, once you've confessed sin, how do you move forward from the guilt? Wow. This is a great question. It's a great question. You want to go or me? Sure. I think um, I, I would, I would, if, if Amy were sitting here, I'd ask her, are we talking guilt or are we talking shame? Mm. Because those two things need to be differentiated. Right. So if a lot of times I think we can feel guilt and that can be a healthy thing because it can pursue, it can push us toward God. But if we confess and God has forgiven us, but we're still feeling that shame, which is normal. If you've done something wrong, you know, you sh- one would feel shame. But, you know, as you've pointed out, shame is like, there's something wrong with, with me. me yeah. What kind of a person would do the thing, right? If I'm holding on to that, there's something that I'm not free from, you know? And so in James, confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed. Mm-hmm. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. That That's where the community piece comes in. You know, that's where if I, if I tell you about the thing I've done mm-hmm. and you still receive me and you don't shun me, mm-hmm. now I'm free, right? Yeah. At least that's the first step toward freedom. And so- um, you know, depending on where you said it was Amy, mm-hmm. depending on where Amy's coming from, I think the guilt can be a powerful motivator. I don't want to do that again. I feel bad for the way I treated my wife. I want to, you know, treat her with honor and respect. That can be a powerful motivator. But if it's shame, I'm a horrible person because I, that needs to be brought to Jesus and it needs yeah. to be brought to somebody else and, the, you know, through someone else. Confess yeah. That. So. Uh, Amy, I want to encourage you to get the book, Everyday a Miracle. I believe, I think it's chapter nine. Can you guys tell me which chapter is on spiritual healing? Mm. I think it's chapter nine on spiritual healing, but I talk specifically about my journey with guilt and my journey with shame. And the enemy had really embedded himself in the gospel was for everybody but me. Yeah, Everybody else can receive forgiveness but me. And here's how Satan worked his way in my mind and in my heart 
was, well, Matt, you knew better. See, that's mm-hmm. shame. Yeah. And so I could never be set free because I wouldn't preach the gospel to myself. And in the chapter, I sit down with Dr. Kraft and he he just had me preach the gospel to myself. Mm. So and I did. And I'm telling you, it was a powerful moment where I was free from that. And it's okay to regret decisions lifelong. I mean, I don't think you should be like, oh yeah, I did that, you know, whatever. Uh, you know, I don't take pride in my sins. Um, I take joy in the fact that I've, I've been forgiven and I've grown mm-hmm. from them. Um, and then there's one other piece in, in being set free. And you mentioned it, you know, James 5, 16, confess your sins one to another. So listen to these words, Amy, so that you may be whole and healed. And um, a couple of weeks ago, we had a, just a moment of church-wide confession. Mm-hmm. And one of our uh, female uh, uh, ministers said that, you know, there were so many people that came forward for prayer. And so she just ran up and she just said, a woman confessed and said, I was going to take this to my grave. Mm. And I feel so badly that she was carrying that and she was able to look somebody in the face. And if you're listening and that was you, I, she didn't tell me what you confessed. That's not my business. You know, um, she didn't share with me what it was, but she shared how meaningful it was to be able to look somebody in the face yeah. and have that be released. And if you haven't done that, that's yeah. where healing is found. I yeah. mean, really try it this week. You know, we talked about try going to church, find someone who's safe. Yeah. That's, that's key. And, and just share. Mm-hmm. And be amazed at what can happen. Like you'll feel lighter. Yeah, and you got to be careful. There was a guy in our church. You know, I, I've I've known him since he was a teenager. And he's in his mid thirties now, and you know, I mean, he was a wreck mm-hmm. early on, struggling with drug addiction, depression, you know, suicidal thoughts. And he just said, "Hey, I want to share my story with people at work." And I said, "Whoa!" Yeah. <laughs> I said, "Whoa!" Got to be safe, people. I know. I right. said, "I love you." And I will never use anything that you share against you. I want you to be careful. Yeah. So there is a power, there's power in sharing our testimony, but people, mm-hmm. you know, people can use that against us competitively. And so you, I, I would say this, it's important to share, um, you know, something with someone, but you don't share everything with everyone. Right. And I'm, I don't know about you. You're probably not, I'm an overshare. Yeah. I, I overshare. Too. Like I'm always like, oh, that was a little awkward. My wife looks at me like, really? Oh yeah, yeah no, I, <laughs> so everybody pray for me. I overshare. I give too many details. Mm-hmm. I, I talk too much. That's my sin issue. Some of you, you don't tell anybody anything and that's your issue. And so we all have to kind of understand where we're coming from. So, but what I would say is the way that you move on from guilt is I would start journaling. You're a great writer. And I would just say, Lord, I'm struggling with this. I went back, I, I found my journal from uh, 2007 to 2009. My wife's like, I didn't know you journaled. I, I did it at work. Yeah. And it was interesting as I was struggling with some of the same things that I struggle with now. And then some things I've been set free from. Yeah. And I rejoiced and I was like, wow, you know, thank you, Jesus. And so I was able to to get over some of those things. It's the power of journaling. So um, I I would say maybe Christian counseling, small group, soul care, and really be intentional about working through that. And no, we all make mistakes. All of us make mistakes. And it's not about perfection. It's about direction. But, you know, what I would say is- you have to forgive yourself too. I think that's one of the hardest things. It's like, okay, Jesus forgives me. But, you know, in, in areas where I've struggled in this, I, there's there's some dark side of me that wants to hold on to not forgiving myself because it's mm. like that self-flagellation, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Okay, well, I deserve this and so I'm just going to hang on to this to my grave or to whatever yeah. because I deserve it. Mm-hmm. And she, I think that's one of the beautiful things about the gospel is Jesus says, yeah. you do deserve it, but you don't have to carry that. Amen. And watch how free you can walk if you don't have to carry yeah. that. But, but we struggle with that. Yeah, and for our non-math majors, flagellation is self-punishment. <laughs> See, this is what happens when we talk with smart people. <laughs> they use big words. That's fair. You know, <laughs> you know, I'm more like Trump. Bigly, I'm hugely. Bigly. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I love how he describes stuff. Uh, it's too good. Too yeah. Good. Um, okay, Sammy from Instagram. Thank you, Sammy. How can I continue to support and encourage my partner's spiritual journey, even if they no longer believe in God? Wow. Mm. Sammy, praying for you. Love you. Thank you for listening. Great question. You want to yeah. go? It's a tough one. It's a, yeah, this is not a softball question. I love it though. Um, You know, support's an interesting word. To me, how can we live a life that's inviting? So so I have somebody very close to me who has used to lead worship in the high school youth group, has completely walked away from the faith, has has said he he no longer believes in God. And it breaks my heart. And so I pray for this person all the time. Um, And one of the things I found myself praying recently, because this has been going on for 20 plus years, and it seems like there's no progress. Mm. 
And so um, I found myself lately praying, God, how should I pray for this person? Right. Because it's really easy to, to pray our will, and I think we should. But when we don't see movement, I think it's a worthwhile question to ask God how he would want me to pray for that person. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, what I got was pray that he sees my value. Pray, mm-hmm. pray that he sees his value. And uh, okay. And that fits. It fits so well because, you know, and so I don't know, you know, we're going through a series on miracles and um, I don't know what God's going to do. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the tricky part about free will is God, God's not going to force this person to right. turn back to him. This person has free will to choose or to not yes. choose. But I think God can continue to invite and to continue to, to um, you know, knock on the door. And so mm-hmm. as I've prayed for this person to see his value before God, yeah, I'm hoping, you know, it, I'm hoping that God, you know, can and will do a miracle. And I don't know. Yeah, yeah. amen. See, I mean, here's what I would say is I would just tell your husband how much you, you love him, how much he means to you and how much you care about him. And then I would just share how important God is to you in a non-judgmental, uh, non-critical way. And then I would just ask, how can I support you um, on your spiritual journey as you've chosen not to believe in God? Because you're the closest person to me on earth. And yet at the most intimate level, we disagree. Mm-hmm. And that's that's a real problem for us. So what would support look like for you? And then hopefully if he loves you, he might ask this question, well, what, what does support look like for you as a person who holds these values and cares about these things? And a great book I would encourage you to read is, gosh, we're just throwing books out, but it's A Grief Observed by Sheldon Von Ochten. Did mm-hmm. I get that name right? Sheldon Von Ochten, they'll put it in the notes. And it's A Severe Mercy, a uh, fantastic book. And his wife, be- I'm sorry, uh, Severe Mercy. Yeah, Severe Mercy by Sheldon Von Ochten. So um, his wife becomes a Christian and he's bitter hmm. because- uh, I got it right because um, he just thinks God is ridiculous. Yeah, and so ultimately, here's the beauty, Sammy, is it didn't drive a wedge in their relationship. It actually brought them together. That doesn't always happen. I'm not saying that's not going to be your story, but again, how, just I would just say, how can I, you be a great wife, a loving wife, a supportive wife? And it's easy to be critical. It's hard to be supportive. So I will yeah. be praying for you. And I would say too, there's a reason this person walked away from yeah. God, and it probably goes back to church or yes. Christian hypocrisy, whatever the thing would be. And I think it's a very worthwhile prayer to also say, God, how can I show this person your love? How can I model that well? Mm-hmm. And that can take on all kinds of different forms. But I think that the more that, you know, if, if someone close to you is struggling with their faith, the more that you and I can be as the best examples of Jesus in their life as, as possible. And to admit, hey, we're we're messed up or here's our journey and here's where we screwed up or whatever. Um, I think that that those types of authentic, authentic, excuse me, those types of authentic moments um, can really, you know, hopefully pave the way for that person to re-enter and, and re-engage mm-hmm. with God. But ultimately it's out of our control, which is which is hard. Yeah. It's really mm-hmm. hard. All right. Anne from Redlands. Reading through Exodus, what was the point of God hardening Pharaoh's heart so many times? I'm not understanding why God would ask Moses and Aaron to free his people, but then make it difficult by hardening Pharaoh's heart. So Anne, there's a series, what did we say it was? It was January of 20... Ten commandments. Yeah. And it was called... Sorry, old rules for new life. Okay, there we go. Sorry, old rules for new life. I should know that. I, it was my sermon series, but I specifically unpacked this. And and if and it's hard sometimes in English, and I don't know what translation you're reading, but um, you know the Hebrew is a little bit different than uh, our English language. And so if you look through it carefully, a great English translation will say, "And Pharaoh hardened his heart." And you'll see that multiple times where Pharaoh is choosing to harden his heart. And then there's a shift. And then it says, and God hardened his heart. And there's a specific number of times where Pharaoh freely chooses to harden his heart. And then ultimately God seals the deal, sears his heart and cements it. And so, you know, uh, theologians call this judicial hardening. And so unfortunately, you know, we, in our traditions, you know, we like to believe that no matter where you are, no matter what you've done, you know, God can speak and you're going to respond. But what happens as God speaks and we reject God, our heart gets harder mm-hmm. and we become more jaded and more angry. And then eventually, you know, I don't want to say it's impossible because all things are possible with God, but it becomes extremely unlikely that a person will ever repent because they've hardened their heart. And so we see this 
you know, throughout scripture. And, um, you know, the word is sclerosis in Greek and it's where we get our, our actual word for heart disease. Hmm. I mean, it's, it's the same word in Greek, um, that's described in the new Testament. I can't remember the word in Hebrew right now, but it's right. This hardening. And so when, uh, I have a friend of mine that's at the heart doctor today and right, they're looking for damage. You can't undo that damage. So, but what we can pray for is an intervention. And so what I would just say is, you know, there was hope for Pharaoh, but ultimately, I mean, what do you do when he just sees miracle after miracle after miracle? And it's clear the Hebrew God is a different God. And many people don't realize this. When the people of Israel fled, it wasn't just Jews that fled. So, you know, Egypt was a multi mm -hmm. multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious society. It was like New York City. People saw God move and so they fled. And so that's why the law and all of the things come down, the covenant that God, you know, um, gives them. And then when, you know, Moses goes up on the mountain, you know, Aaron's left with a lot of pagans and they're far more Egyptian than they are Jewish. And they start partying and worshiping mm -hmm. a cow, mm -hmm. you know? And so God has to help them learn what it means to really follow him. And so, so, and I don't agree with the, with, with how the English makes you think what I would say is, I think it's pretty clear that multiple times God, um, you know, Moses goes before Pharaoh and Moses, or Pharaoh chooses to harden his heart. Yeah. So. And, and I'm so glad you asked that question because I have a, a good friend of mine who is agnostic and this is one of the main reasons that he mm -hmm. points that out. So I, I love that answer. It's an excellent answer. Yeah. And so, you know, there, there, there are, uh, there are groups of Christians called Calvinists, um, you know, who are fatalists. And so they believe that ultimately everything has been predetermined. I don't see that in the text. There, there's, there is difficulty understanding free will and in what has God determined, because clearly we have some free will and clearly God has determined some things, um, you know, and what has God determined, whatever he chooses to determine because he's sovereign. But ultimately, I believe that human beings are responsible for their sin. Pharaoh is responsible for his sin because he had a choice and it was a real choice. It wasn't a fake choice. It was a real choice. And he chose himself over the one true God. And ultimately, um, you know, I, I think that's why people will not go to heaven, not because God artificially hardened their hearts, but because they, through their own free will, rejected God. And over time, the heart just becomes so hard that they, they don't hear God. It's why the New Testament says today, when you hear God's voice, do not harden your hearts. That's an actual verse in scripture. And we have to be very, very careful uh, because when the Holy Spirit's speaking, we want to respond. Mm -hmm. We want to respond in that moment because it's important. Well, how many people see miracles yeah. like Pharaoh did and choose to believe something else instead of, you know, saying, well, maybe maybe there is something interesting going on, right? That's a hardening of the yeah. heart when we choose otherwise. No, man. So, I mean, I, I saw a miracle where I literally was talking with this guy who was dying of COVID and we prayed together, not a believer. He went home like a day or two later from the mm -hmm. hospital, totally healed. And I was talking with him. I said, so, so how has this encouraged your faith? And he goes, ah, some people get lucky. Some people don't. And I'm just, my jaw yeah. drops. I'm like, yeah. that's not your attitude when you called me on the phone to pray with you. Right. You weren't like, hey, it's math. Right. You asked the God of heaven to intervene. He did. And now you're just like, well, mm -hmm. because ultimately what's Pharaoh? Pharaoh, if Pharaoh submits to God. He has to admit to all his people. Yeah. He's not God. He and we it. like yep. worship. Mm -hmm. It's right. I mean, you know, it'd be pretty nice to be like, oh, you know, Matt Brown's God. Yeah. Right. And ultimately self-worship is the greatest form of idolatry, which we all struggle with. Yeah. So great question. All right. Chantel from Fontana. Is it possible for both partners who are trying to break out of their toxic? Is it possible for both partners who are trying to break out of their toxic habits? Is it possible? Can both mature if both are willing to work on themselves and walk with God? I would say absolutely. Of course, it's going to be really, really hard to change the whole relationship if just one person changes. But we had uh, the Millers. Do you know the Millers? Yep. Man, if you guys are not involved in marriage ministry at Sandals Church, get involved. It is Miller time. It is time. These guys are great. But I love what Tammy said. You know, you can improve 50% of your marriage. Yeah. You and everybody who's listening, who's frustrated uh, with your marriage and you're focused on your spouse, think about it. You can make today your marriage 50% better if you change. Mm -hmm. But what we often do is we say, let's do it together. And ultimately what marriage is, it's a daily practice of dying to self and saying, okay, how can I improve this? And so 
What I would say is if you're in a toxic relationship, I think it's harder to change because the old norms are just so powerful. It, it's truly hard to create new habits. So what I would do is I'd get in counseling yeah. and, and I would just say, hey, let's do this, not guilt, not to throw mud at each other, but just to say, how, how do we change this? What are the habits that we've gotten into? What's our family history? How were we raised? Uh, you know, What's the brokenness that we inherited? One of the things I love that the Millers say is your problems with your marriage started before you ever got married. Yeah. Yeah, it what messages about yourself have yeah. you adopted along your path that you're bringing into that relationship mm -hmm. that your spouse didn't deserve, yes. right? And uh, I would 100% echo counseling is huge, but I'm hopeful, right? If they're both pursuing God and they're both pursuing God together and they're seeking counseling together, I think some amazing yeah. things could be happening. Yeah, and it's going to be hard. Mm -hmm. It's work. Yeah. Um, you know, it's work. You know, Tammy and I, my wife turned 50 this year. So seven months ago, she said, hey, could I come to the gym with you? And I was like, okay, we got to have some boundaries. Because, you know, leading your spouse is is a difficult thing. Yeah. Um, you know, I lead thousands of people. Leading my wife is way the harder. One. <laughs> yeah. And so I just was like, look, okay. And so, you know, it was really, really hard. And she was really, really frustrated, really sore, mm -hmm. had a bad attitude. We had to have a couple of pep talks about that. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's her 50th birthday and my son gets up to speak about her and he's all, my mom's 50th year is the year she got jacked. Mm. So she's looking great, yeah. but it was a seven month process. And so any real change is hard change. Yeah. You know, if you're, if you're trying to quit your addiction to porn, like those feelings aren't going to go away. You have to rewire your brain and that yeah. takes time. It takes time to um, eat better, mm -hmm. sleep better. You know, the bad habits you've created, you didn't create those in a day. They're not fixed in a day. They're fixed over time. What we can ask the Holy Spirit to do is give us strength, continually inviting him. And, and the beauty of, of spiritual strength is we're both saying, okay, God, we need help. Yeah. So help us here. So I would just say, I, I absolutely agree with Nate. Yes, yes. I mean, yes, you can change. I see it all the time. I've seen I've seen God heal. I've seen God grow. Um, but just know it's, it's going to be work. It's going to be a challenge. Tammy yeah, and I yeah. got in a fight over the feelings chart one time mm -hmm. in the car. And she's like, we suck at the feelings chart. Yeah, that's why there's a chart. Yeah, and you're getting better, yes. right? I mean, that's that's the whole thing. Yeah. Do you see it as a journey? Because, mm -hmm. and I would just say to this couple, like, don't give up. Yeah, You know, it is going to be, you know, a ton of hard work. Yeah. And, and that's something that in our society, we don't value as much anymore. Um, and I think relational work is the most difficult. I can think of many a counseling session that I've just been exhausted afterwards, yeah. but it's worth it. Yeah. You know, so keep fighting yeah. in a good way. Yeah. Keep fighting Amen. for your marriage. Yeah. All right, Paige. From La Mirada, I live in an ungodly world. Yes, you do, Paige. I don't know how La Mirada is, but it's pretty much everywhere. I it's live California, in an, so. Yeah, I live in an ungodly world with ungodly family members in an ungodly household. Wow. Okay, praying for you, Paige. How can I stop overthinking so much and just get free and stay free? Um, you know, they've done a lot of research on, you know, whatever you're focusing on has you. And so what I would just do is make a list every day of the good things that are happening yeah. because it's so easy to be overwhelmed by the negative. And so our brains are wired to focus on whatever they're thinking about. And so, you know, when you wake up in the morning, just say, okay, you know, what does the Bible say? This is the day the Lord has made. Listen to the command. Let us rejoice, rejoice. and be glad in it. And so that's a choice. The Lord made the day. I'm going to rejoice in it. It's never going to go the way that I planned. Mm -hmm. You know, people are, are are not magically going to turn into angels, <laughs> you know? Um, you know, it's so funny. You know, we have an election year this year and people just think elections transform things. And I just always, yeah, but we're pulling from the same swimming pool, yeah. <laughs> the same septic tank. Well, we're putting our hope in the wrong things. Yeah, if that's and the so, case. so what we got to do is we say, okay, Lord, um, you know, Philippians says, set your mind on things above. Yeah. So what is God doing? W what's happening in my life? So, but, yeah, and I would just say, like, there's a couple of things, but like how, how much control, not mm -hmm. control, how much power are you giving these external yeah. circumstances over your life? Because yes, we live in an ungodly world. And I find the more time I look at the news, mm -hmm. the more grumpy I get about the ungodliness of our world. It doesn't mean that we live in a rabbit hole and, yeah. and never, you know, pop out to see what's going on. But I've noticed for me, mm -hmm. I have to limit my news intake yeah. so that I can focus more on God because at the end of the day, God is sovereign. Yes. And yes, we're an ungodly world. Yeah. We're, we're, why are we surprised about this? For the ungodly household, you know, how old is Paige? Is she, you know, yeah. 13 and stuck yeah. with ungodly parents or is she, you know, 26 and able to move out? Because at some point in time, if things get so ungodly and so toxic, you know, maybe a change of scenery would be a good idea. 
Yeah. Page boundaries are an important thing. So one of the things I always point to in the last chapter in the Bible, Revelation 22, the city of heaven uh, in Jerusalem has a wall around it. <laughs> yeah. And so um, like even God has healthy boundaries. And then it says, why? Who is he keeping out? He's keeping out the dogs, the sorcerers, and the immoral practitioners. God is saying, look, even in this new earth, I'm going to protect you with a healthy boundary. And so many Christians have a hard time with that because we want to love, we want to believe, you know, um, you know, you got to love the gorilla, just don't live in a cage with it yeah. because it's going to hurt you and harm you. And um, the thing you may need to do is to get out of that cage. And so I would say get in counseling, get in a small group, talk with people, um, talk with people who know your story. Because um, the negative part of counseling is the counselor only knows what you share. Yeah. And it's easy to dupe your counselor. And I'm not putting down counseling, but they can only interpret the information that they're giving. They might have some intuition, but, um, you know, they, they might be missing some key details because we all share things in a way that make us look better than right. we are. And we tend to share things making the people who've hurt us worse than they actually are. And so I'm not saying that's true in your case page, but I'd but also I, say too, like yeah. the verse from Proverbs, you know, guard your heart above yeah. all else yes. because it is the wellspring of life. And, and I just wonder, you know, you were talking about what do we focus on? And if I'm focusing on all the negative, yeah. that's going to affect my heart. Yeah. And if I'm focused, so, so what I would ask Paige, like in, how can you be an active participant in guarding your own heart? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that you isolate. It doesn't mean that you only surround yourself with mm -hmm. people in your bubble, but it does mean that you do be intentional about protecting what's on the inside. Yeah. Amen. All right. Um, thank you, Nathan, for being on the show. Is your book available on audiobook yet? It will be on audiobook in about two weeks, we we predict. Okay. Yeah. How are you liking that process? It's hard. I know. <laughs> I yeah, I, I really struggled with it. Yeah. And so um it's way easier to talk than to read out loud. Wow. Yeah. And I'm dyslexic, so I just yeah. slaughter sentences yeah. that I wrote, which is really helpful. Right. You know, it's not like I'm trying to get in the the mind of an author. I am the author. <laughs> right. So so make sure that but you But it get, is on Amazon. Yeah, get yeah. this book on Amazon. Nathan Westwick. I never call you Nathan. Do you want me to call you Nate? I call you Nate. I like Nate. Nate, okay. Yeah, but Nathan is my professional name. Yes. Matthew is my professional <laughs> name. Yes. Um Nathan Westwick, clearing the path. Get it today. And I'm going to be praying for you guys. So let me just say before we close, uh, thanks for checking out this episode. You can always submit your own questions to the podcast. And let me just say this, the podcast is only as good as the questions that you guys These submit. These were some great questions yeah. today. Thank yeah. you for everybody that send those in. So send them in anytime. You can go to move.sc slash ask, or you can go to the Sandals Church app. I mean, the, our app is fantastic. I hear this all the time. Sandals Church is the best app of any church. Mm -hmm. So download the app, get that. My sermon notes on the weekends are on the app. Uh, there are all kinds of great things on the app. Um, Bible that reading just, plans. Yes, Bible reading plans, incredible stuff. This podcast, you can submit a question. So I will see you guys next time. Thanks for joining us. And thanks, Nathan. Thank for you. Being here. Hey guys, thank you so much for listening to this episode. My book, Every Day a Miracle, comes out March 5th. Please pre-order today. It is a book about a journey towards trusting God who heals inside and out. Thanks for watching the episode.